Thank you very much. My name is Pat Crowley, and I'm here to share some really good news. And that is that the world is not ending. <laughs> Despite some really scary things you may hear, like there's only about 60 years left in the fertility of our topsoil in the U.S. Ocean fisheries, are, about 90% of them are in collapse. Superbugs, because of the overuse of antibiotics, antimicrobial resistant bacteria may kill more people than cancer by the year 2050. Landfills, of course, about a 15 year capacity left in the United States, let alone all the pollution they're currently causing. And of course, uh, carbon carrying capacity of our climate has exceeded safe limits and we may potentially be in for one wild climate ride. But the climate has changed on this planet and it will all balance out. So let's all take a deep breath and relieve any anxiety I just gave. <laughs> One caveat to that, though, is that the balancing process may not be hospitable for human survival. So there's that. <laughs> there's that. I happen to like humans, and I have two miniature humans at home that I really like. So I've been on a quest to proactively balance the future of their food and water. It turns out a lot of our food that we eat is very out of balance. For example, this is a sea bass. And it's one of the most commonly farmed fishes around the world. But it didn't always start that way. At first, it was wild caught, and it was a premium on the dinner table. We, it was a high-priced item, and because of that, it funded the entire growth of the farming industry for sea bass. We, we had this perception of value, even though blind taste test after blind taste test shows that we can't really tell the difference between the taste of it and other similar white fish. And there's no higher nutritional value. And they're awfully inefficient to farm. They need some like 17 pounds of feed for every one pound of sea bass. They don't tolerate dense populations. You have to feed them live feed when they're juveniles because they're blind. It's ridiculously inefficient. But because we had this perception of value, it funded the growth of the farming. So in this quest of balance, I came upon insects, incredibly more resource efficient. Compared to animal protein, use significantly less feed and water coming in, and compared to plant protein, use a lot less area and energy inputs as well. I wasn't the first one to come up with this. People have been talking about it for decades. But the underlying conclusion was that the cultural barrier around insects was just too large to overcome. And so that's where I decided to start. I knew we had to start in the mind if we wanted to see the farming, a more sustainable farming of insects. So I started a food company, and I tried to make it as easy as possible for you to eat bugs. I took crickets, and I milled them down to flour so you didn't even have to look at them. And then I put them into energy bars and things that were very familiar to you, and uh, in an effort to create a pull-through demand for the farming side of insects. So here's a bit of a glimpse into that. This is actually a third generation cricket farmer in the United States by the name of Jack. And we're holding the very first bag of organically raised crickets for human consumption. And it was taken five years ago. And now today, we're able to tell all those naysayers that said the cultural barrier was just too large. Uh, you actually may have had a point. <laughs> yeah. It's really hard. <laughs> And so as a company, we've experienced you know, wildly mediocre success. <laughs> but only when you measure it upon one metric. And our effort to create an idea revolution to provide the growth of the industry, we're making some headway. Uh, there's now dozens of cricket farmers in the US that have joined Jack and hundreds all over the world, some of them making their own cricket flour and other delicious products as well. So this is actually just the very beginning of the story, and it gets much deeper the closer you look at insects in our agriculture. And they're poised to potentially solve some of the most problematic agricultural and health challenges we face. These challenges are so large that sustainability can no longer be just a vision, but it needs to be a starting point with how we approach our food. We need to go beyond that and repair some of the damage caused by industrialized agriculture and a more regenerative approach to growing our food. And insects can play a major role in solving some of these challenges because they're at the very forefront of two idea revolutions occurring right now. The first is that we're shifting our mentality from an extraction, monoculture-based mentality more to an ecosystem approach 
that views health and value in diversity. And luckily for us, there's examples of healthy ecosystems all over, and they're called nature. And in nature's ecosystems, there are many times they're perfect examples of a closed-loop system that opposed to industrialized agriculture is not propped up by stored energy from fossil fuels and petrochemicals, fertilizers, pesticides. In fact, they thrive in diversity, and that's what makes them resilient to changes in our climate. There, it goes by many fancy names. People are calling it biomimicry or agroecology, and it overlaps with permaculture and biodynamics and regenerative ag. But I, I like to just sum it all up by saying, what would nature do? WWND. <laughs> we need some bracelets. <laughs> the second major idea of revolution occurring right now is the focus on the beneficial impact of microbes in the world around us. For example, in your body alone, there's more microbes than a hundred times the stars in our galaxy. And we're just now uncovering the many benefits they provide to you. For example, increasing digestion, boosting your immune system, depressing anxiety. Also, they're being linked to cancer-fighting agents. And they're also very important in the world outside of us as well, in soil, in nitrogen fixation, and providing nutrients to our plants. And the more we are uncovering about microbes, the more we're discovering that they're the invisible driver between, behind much of life on this planet. So insects represent a confluence of those two ideas because they are more than just a little organism, they're actually an ecosystem of these microbes that have evolved together for millions of years to work together. And they're arguably one of the most successful life forms on the planet with more than a million species of insects and they have incredibly important roles in many of our ecosystems. Much of that is in the processing of organic waste. So here's a new project we're working on. Speaking of organic waste, this is a million tons of agricultural waste that's produced in palm fields. And much of this is either goes to compost, landfill, or even is burned currently. And so, what would nature do with this waste? Well, Palm falls in the forest, immediately fungus starts growing on it, breaks down the lignin, provides more nutrients for insects and plants around it. So that's what we do. We take the palm waste, add some fungus, create, goes through a fermentation process, and we create this kimchi kombucha for the bugs, foster that probiotic or the microbial activity. And this is what the vision of how it will look at scale is. So again, starting point is sustainable. Solar power, it only, cap only uses captured rainwater. And then beyond that, this facility will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 20 million tons. But these designs are happening all over the world at, much, at very different scales as well. Designed to be implemented on site in an agricultural setting so that you eliminate the transportation emissions associated with getting rid of waste. And their process, insects can process almost any organic waste, from almond hulls to uh, spent grains, even post-consumer waste that contributes to some of the 40% of our food that we grow that goes to waste in this country. And yes, they can even process grape skins. <laughs> insects are incredible. Uh, the microbes associated with them are some of the most incredible bioprocessors on this planet. And so that's what goes into the farm, and what comes out? Well, one example is the soil, a very potent biofertilizer, rich with all those microbes that can help regenerate that topsoil that we're losing. Another is the insect, of course. And so what do we do with the insect? This is a Hermesia lucens, or as I like to call them, sun grubs. Well, remember that fish? United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization is predicting that aquaculture will lead in filling the global protein gap in the future. And one of those, when I mentioned that 17 pounds that goes into one pound, most of that is harvested ocean life, often the smallest creatures that have residual effects on the entire oceanic ecosystem. Insects, and this one in particular, have very similar nutritional profile, high in omega fatty acids, and can potentially alleviate the pressure on our oceans. And maybe we could feed them to a little more efficient fish, too. I was dumbfounded when I found out that in the United States, we spend $1 billion feeding 
fake insects to trout and salmon. <laughs> so maybe we could feed them the real thing. <laughs> what else are we doing with insects? They're being fed to chickens. And when, and when that happens, they receive up to a 90% reduction in their susceptibility to many diseases, like typhoid fever. All because, same thing with us, those microbes increase their immune system. Because in, the, in nature, birds eat bugs. And when you feed them a diet that they evolved eating, they're healthier. Potentially eliminating the need for antibiotics in our feed. Currently, 90% of our antibiotics are used in agriculture. And that's what's contributing to a lot of that antimicrobial resistant bacteria. Or maybe you could join those that are bold enough to challenge their own cultural norms and try them for yourselves. <laughs> and when you do that, you're alleviating some of the very dangerous apathy that's built upon a fallacy that our children will engineer themselves out of the environmental mess we're handing to them. And I know that the promise of insect farming is very grandiose, but in reality, it's a very big exercise in humility because it requires us to take a step back and let Mother Nature do what she does best. And if we can, maybe, just maybe, she'll, along, she'll allow us to go along for the ride. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.